In this video, we're going to be discussing about, uh, in my opinion, the biggest scam of modern chess. And with that, I'm referring to chess engines. I am sure that everyone that has been playing chess for uh, a little while by now, I mean, perhaps even from their very first game of their life, has uh, received uh, feedback related to their game by Stockfish or any other chess engine related that doesn't really matter. If you are a little bit confused, it looks like something like this. On the screen, you can see the Holy Game Review by uh, Chess.com, the largest platform at the moment. And uh, this is uh, one of their main uh, selling pitches. And uh, usually this is how lower rated players try to see whether they played a good game or not, which uh, despite the fact that I think this could become a very useful thing, if you know how to actually use it properly, which in my opinion, most people clearly don't. I am making this video trying to spread awareness of the fact that looking at chess with a computer, especially as a newer player, with that I'm referring basically everyone that is below 1500, will most of the times create uh, more harm than good. I mean, if you think about it, trying to learn chess while watching the computer is like uh, going out uh, for a marathon if you've never ran before in your life. So that is pretty much an impossible task unless you're the next Elliot Kapchogi or you're born in Kenya. So in this video, I'm gonna be walking you through my thinking process as an international master while playing the Vienna game against low rated opponents. And after each game, we're gonna be doing a detailed uh, computer analysis and I'm gonna be explaining you how to actually use these tools in order to make them somewhat useful. So if that's something interesting for you, let's just dive right into the games. All right, everybody getting the white pieces against uh, somebody who's rated uh, almost 1000. So for this rating range, we will be mainly uh, seeing uh, e5 from black against e4. And we're gonna be sticking to the Vienna by uh, developing our knight. And one of the main ideas is to Keep this option of uh, going for uh, f4 in the future, which, you know, combined uh, with uh, moves such as bishop c4, d3, f4, knight f3, castle, the rook on f1 is going to be a pretty happy camper, I think you can tell, uh, after possibly getting this open file. So, uh, opponent going for a pretty common sideline already, going for the move c6, where... I already mentioned that you could be going for f4, but I don't think it's the best move in the current position because after e4, problem is, uh, well, there's a threat of queen h4 check, which actually a lot of people tend to forget about while they are trying to play the Vienna gambit. And usually we'll have to stop that by going knight f3, but then d5, black is able to strike in the center and it feels like they're getting an okay position. Now the alternative, to go bishop to c4, maybe stopping d5 for now, but after knight f6 uh, with d5 on the next move, that will simply make uh, black's idea even stronger. Now, knight f3 could actually be an interesting plan hitting the e5 pawn and uh, then kind of forcing black to play d6. And that is actually a very decent option. I think that's a good move. But I know for a fact, because I covered this in my uh, Vienna course on chess ball, that the best move is um, actually d4, which is a little bit counterintuitive because it's uh, breaking a lot of the standard uh, opening rules because after d4, ed4, we'll have to take back with a queen, developing uh, our queen early on in the game. And um, now you may actually be like uh, a little bit confused because you see me breaking this kind of main opening principles that uh, you shouldn't be developing your queen early on in the game. So uh, actually the way you want to think about chess and how you should be trying to build up on your game, you want to like master these uh, sort of basic concepts and avoid these like typical mistakes, like try to develop uh, knights before bishops, don't move the same uh, piece for... Uh, more, more than once if you don't have to play according to the center, uh, if they attack you on the side, try to strike in the center and all these kind of like basic rules, you need to like have a solid understanding of them. And then what actually is going to take you from a decent player to a strong player 
it's uh, when you are able to make uh, this step to um, know how to break the rules. So uh, I know for a fact D4 is the move just because I remember it and it is actually quite easy to understand why. Because let's actually understand why is it uh, not good to develop your queen early into the game. Well, normally if you just uh, go ahead like that and let's say think of maybe like the Scandinavian opening. So like e4, d5, ed5, black has to take with a queen. We can play knight c3, hitting that queen, gaining a tempo. So the queen is usually uh, gonna be uh, something that we can attack and gain a lot of time uh, while finishing development. Well, the difference is, it's a super situational case here because of this c6 move after ed4, queen d4, the knight is not gonna be able to reach that square harassing our queen. So funnily enough, after the queen is developing early onto such a central square, but it simply has no way to attack it. So this, uh, this is why we can sort of break the rule in this case. But I mean, I'm pretty sure you get it at this point. Hopefully. Probably not. Uh, anyways, he goes queen e7. What do we do? We think about uh, taking. That's usually the most uh, straightforward move. And another candidate is knight f3. Developing and uh, hitting e5, so <clears throat> I wouldn't really thinking of anything uh, besides that. Now, why do I want to take? This move would actually be uh, bringing his queen into the middle if they want to like recapture the pawn. And then I already told you what's the downside of developing the queen within the first move. It becomes an object for an attack. So we can play the most natural move, knight f3, developing, and then uh, hitting this queen. So d5, pretty easy and straightforward. They are kind of forced to take on e5, otherwise we can just like support a pawn with both f4 or knight f3. So this is clearly uh, what black should be playing. We're gonna go knight f3 and then they have to move the queen again, which is giving us uh, the um, tempo to complete development, do whatever basically. So uh, yeah, just knight f3. Very simple, winning a tempo. You can already see that I developed two minor pieces while uh, black is still like kind of struggling to find a safe spot for this queen. Now, c7 would be like a clever uh, a treating move for my opponent if they're able to find it. But um, also we may see some kind of queen a5 uh, that is uh, a little bit like a Scandinavian type of move. Um, so, yeah, on queen c7, I think you have basically like two main plans. You can either just go, let's say, for uh, bishop to c4, and then uh, castle short. So that's like one of them. Even queen e6, let's say, kind of similar. You can go bishop d3 now because c4 is no longer available, and then castle. But also, another plan is going bishop e3 or bishop f4, and then queen e2 along castle. So I'm curious. Which one uh, do you guys think it's better? Because both seem like quite reasonable and um, I feel like white has an edge in both. But in general, whenever you play these positions, I would say um, trying to punish them going with long castle, it's usually more straightforward. Okay, if you look at it with the engine, probably the eval, it's not going to be like dramatically changing. Probably both short castle and long castle are equally good. But the short castle plan is usually harder to execute, at least from my experience. Might be wrong on that, but probably not. So, we do e6. Now, let's actually try to visualize how the game could potentially go. Let's say bishop e3, he plays knight f6, hitting the e4 pawn. Now we can defend that, or we can simply ignore it. Um, or we can play e5. But let's say we ignore it, because that feels to be the best move. Queen d2, knight e4, hitting our queen, we have to take queen takes and we long castle. And in that position, we can notice that these pieces are on the same file. And black has to move the bishop and then castle, which means it's like two moves away from castling, which is usually pretty dangerous. So I think the pawn sacrifice is definitely very interesting. Now, after bishop e3, knight f6, you could also, let's say, just play bishop to d3, defend the e4 pawn. However, I feel like that's a little bit slow. And normally when you're ahead, 
uh, so many tempis like this, I think it makes a lot of sense to just, uh, let's say, sacrifice this pawn on e4, invest it, because we get to tempis, I mean, um, you know, with nowadays inflation, pawns are not even that strong anymore, so uh, we'd much rather have the asset of uh, going for like long castle and getting a quick development, and opponent already making a little bit of a mistake, and I wonder if you guys can actually notice why this is a mistake. Because they have played the move d5, but at the end of the day, I do believe that uh, because of the fact that we managed to unpin, and perhaps that's something that our opponent missed, because say you continue with bishop f4, then the same d5 move is actually way more interesting. Now with the pawn on, I mean with the bishop on e3, the pawn on e4 is no longer pinned, so on d5, but actually simply free to take, hitting their queen, and uh, if they take with the pawn, I'm curious how would you guys uh, recapture? Because you could take with a knight, threatening a massive fork, but you can also take with a queen, which is seemingly not creating any threats. So I'm wondering how you guys would uh, recapture in this position. I think this is actually quite an uh, instructive exercise. You could let me know in the comments whether you'd uh, take with a queen or with a knight, perhaps you won't take at all, you can let me know. Because I feel like this is such an important position, you like really wanna pay attention to this guys, because I think the most common move in this position by like a lot of players, and like the most interesting part about this, the computer won't even think it's a mistake. Probably the computer says, this is the best move, but in my opinion, I think that is a mistake. And the main reason is it's not applying, like, let's say, the basic concepts that whenever you win a pawn, you want to be forcing an endgame. So the computer will kind of see in the future that they're going to be able to get an initiative, play for checkmate, but that would be very risky and not the approach that you want to have as a human player. So queen d5, perhaps a little bit worse, according to the computer, I mean... I don't know, guys. I'm just like making the assumption. You'll have to wait and uh, we'll both check it together in the post game analysis. But my intuition says computer thinks 95 is a little bit better. But taking with a queen, I think, is 10 times better for your uh, long term improvement as a player because we're almost forcing queens off. Like, what, what does he have to do? If he wants to keep queens on, he's just gonna leave the super powerful queen in the middle. Think of it like he goes queen g6, queen whatever. We cast a long threatening mate in one. He kind of has to allow the queen trade. And what this will result in, we just have uh, an endgame with an extra pawn. So see, knight f6, hitting this. Definitely could look for interesting ideas, like give a check, but I'm just going to keep it very simple. My queen is under attack. So what do we do? We just move the queen. A queen e6, he's going to take with a bishop. And uh, now we've got a bunch of options, so uh, we could definitely uh, think of uh, something like uh, knight to g5, which could be interesting because it's harassing the e6 bishop. However, I feel like we should be trying to look for a move that's developing something, because this knight is already developed, we should uh, think of uh, developing the other pieces. So from that perspective, we have two moves. I think one is... Long castle, the other one is bishop to b5 check. With bishop b5, we're not really trying to go for the mate or anything crazy like that, but it's just kind of like a developing move with tempo. It can hardly be a bad move, so I think I'm just going to play bishop b5, gaining a tempo, and what should we do next? Because he is most likely going to go knight c6 or knight bd7, we don't really care. Our strategy kind of remains the same. Yes, we can try to maybe go for like the uh, exploitative approach, going 94, trying to exploit the pin, but that's not how I would think about it. I would think of it as, okay, we just need to finish development. So for that means need to get castled and we need to get the rooks on the, into the game. And specifically, where do you want to have the rooks? You want to have the rooks into the open files. So D and E file, this is where our rooks belong. So for that, we cast along, already the rook is there, and that puts us one move away from developing all of our pieces to the center. And once we do that, 
we're actually allowed to move the other pieces twice. So really pay attention to this. I haven't moved any of my pieces more than once. This is how you want to approach your opening. You don't want to be wasting time moving your pieces, of course, unless there's like a concrete tactic and you win a pawn or it's like really an important reason behind it. But most people that move the knight twice, they're like, oh, I think moving the knight is interesting. And they would do that, I mean, you have to think of it here. Okay, here, it was kind of interesting, but most people would be like in this position, consider, oh, why not jump with a knight? Activating. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, dude, you haven't like developed any of your pieces. What are you doing? Just get castled. So this is exactly the kind of opening mistake that you want to avoid. He plays bishop e7. Once again, we could potentially try to play a bit more aggressive and go like knight g5. No need for that. Keep it simple. Rook onto the open files. Now the opening phase is complete. So think of it. Move 12. We have developed all of our pieces. We have an extra pawn. And this is just a, an amazing opening that you want to get. And remember, there was nothing really prepared. I mean, the only kind of move that I knew from home was d4. The rest we were able to find simply by following uh, typical and simple principles that are, you know, common sense opening moves, basically. So we have this opponent. Opponent just plays uh, a6. Now, what should we do with that bishop? I feel like definitely uh, retreating could be an option. Just, uh, you know, I'm curious, where would you retreat the bishop? Because I feel like uh, most people would take either a4 as a retreating square or d3. But I think there's another interesting retreating square for the bishop, which is f1. And that is actually a very interesting square for the bishop because it's not uh, blocking the connection between the rooks. So the bishop could later on be maneuvered or like it could stay there for a little while. Um, I think that's actually a very interesting move. Now, taking on d7 is an interesting idea, but um, it's giving up the bishop for the knight. If you think about it, yes, you're trading tree for tree, but I think that's a little bit of a misconception. Because, uh, well, normally when you get thought that, okay, queen is worth nine points, uh, rook is five, knights and bishop are three, and the pawns are equal one each. That is kind of true, but I think it's a little bit outdated, guys. If you ever had that, that's a bit of like an old uh, just uh, uh, ABC that you've got. Because I feel like nowadays the bishops are a little bit stronger and it's been like that forever. It's just that people kind of picked up on this more recently. And uh, in my opinion, I think the bishop should be valued like uh, three and a quarter and the knight three. So taking on d7 would be like a little bit of a negative trade. Yes, we do afford to give up the bishop here because we already have an extra pawn. Not going to be a disaster, but even better to keep it. So, uh, yeah, bishop to f1, kind of passive. The only reason why I would think to play this move is whether we need to have the open file, which could definitely be something interesting to keep in mind. But maybe more important is that after bishop d3 castle, then we could use an idea like knight d4 and then jump with the knight on f5. This could possibly be interesting. So that's why I think in this particular case, bishop d3 is a move. Also, just uh, going bishop a4, bishop bt, trying to exchange this bishop makes sense. But I feel like uh, no need to get the double pawns in that scenario. So I'm just going to go to d3. It is a pretty tough decision. I think it's quite close between bishop d3 and bishop f1. Probably the computer won't actually say there's like a huge difference. But uh, yeah, I'm just like... Uh, trying to provide you with like the options that bishop to f1 is a move that a lot of people would not even consider because it's just like, dude, what are you doing? Just placing the bishop on like the natural square? Why would you ever do that? Well, uh, you know, the bishops are long range pieces. So as long as uh, they're not like blocking the rooks, they're doing quite a lot of job even, you know, from like um, a square that's uh, really behind, you know, you can think of it as, uh, let's say... Um, in soccer, when you've got like a, like a corner, yeah, I'm not sure like what's the name in English. It must be that or like, let's say the bishop is executing like a free kick. The bishop is like great at that. Okay. He can stay wherever the bishop has very good free kick. Okay. You can like do, do the setup, just give a great assist. So bishop is great for that. Anywhere on the board, basically. Pulling castles. Now, 
we have moved and developed all of our pieces, brought in the rooks. Now we're allowed to move uh, the same piece again. So we're trying to look for concrete moves. That's how we want to uh, actually come up uh, with the best move. Now, what do we have when it comes to like a concrete threat? It doesn't really look like black has a lot of weaknesses yet. So uh, what should we look for? We can try to attack his pieces. So uh, the knights are quite well defended. It's going to be pretty tough to get to attack the knights. But the piece that could be pretty vulnerable is the e6 bishop. So for that, we've got like two options to attack it. Either knight d4 or knight g5. And I think normally I would stick with knight d4 just because it's more of like a central move. So the knight from d4 is controlling way more squares than it would do on g5. And just from like a positional point of view, the knight is just a little bit better placed there. Hitting the bishop now, say, what would happen if opponent is just sleeping? Yeah, not paying attention to the board. Say he just does h6. We're going to be able to take on e6, and then he's going to be having an isolated pawn on e6. Now, the isolated pawn on e6 would be a pretty big weakness because it simply won't be able to uh, be defended by any other pawns, and it's usually just going to be a pawn that we could easily win. Now, opponent just plays bishop to d6, so kind of targeting this pawn, which is a little bit of a poison pawn. Um, this is actually kind of like resembling the famous uh, match between uh, Bobby Fischer and Spassky, where uh, Fischer took, uh, like, let's say, a marginal pawn like that, going for some complications, but he ended up losing to g3, and then the bishop got trapped. Fischer clearly knew that and was aware of it, but he was just doing Fischer things. So, uh, putting this bishop to d6. Now, should we... Uh, Let's say, um, avoid the main idea of our last move. I mean, bishop d6 is not really changing much, so we should just keep uh, our main idea of taking the bishop and creating an isolated pawn. Now, we actually have two very interesting moves which uh, you guys should try to find. There is definitely an interesting uh, idea to just focus on the uh, weak e6 pawn, but it also... Uh, because of his uh, last move, sort of, we have a bit of an interesting tactical motive that uh, you can try to pick up on. Because uh, why is this happening? It's basically because uh, Black's bishop is undefended. So how do we take advantage of that? We go for the discovery. Bishop takes on h7, check, opening up the rook, and then picking up the bishop. Now, we're of course a little bit lucky that this happened, but let's say there was not such a little trick. We could have continued with bishop c4, putting pressure on this, and slowly but surely picking up the free pawn. So bishop c4 probably equally strong, hitting the bishop and e6. Perhaps that's actually even better, because if I think about it, bishop takes on e6 after the bishop moves will uh, also win the knight. So I'm not even going to go for bishop h7. I think that's a mistake. I think even simpler and stronger, just do this. And uh, to me, it looks like uh, we're simply about to win a piece. I don't know what do you guys think about this, but uh, I'm struggling to really find uh, a move for black. So uh, what should they try uh, here to defend? Okay, rook e8. We see that, covering e6, but uh, what is the issue with this move? Well, simply forgets about a hanging bishop, so hell yeah, we take it. That's a bishop. That is, uh, that is legitness. I think we can take it. That was legitness. Yeah, it was. Huh? We can just uh, pick up that. That's a free bishop. Because knight g4, okay. Now, he is going after this, and perhaps after the h2 pawn. But what is the downside of this move? Yes, it's not defending e6, but it's also like leaving the d7 knight undefended. So, we just pick up the free knight and... I mean, position was completely winning already, but you see that usually... Uh, these players have like a really weak mindset. And what I mean with that, I'm not necessarily trying to trash the low-rated players, even though that may be the case sometimes. I'm trying to highlight the fact that uh, they give up very easily. They make a mistake and then they just lose interest into the game. And this is okay, like a case where I was completely winning, but it's some sometimes even smaller things. Like they blunder a pawn or they miss something and then they just lose confidence like completely. And... After that, let's say, 
for the first moves, uh, they play pretty decent until the mistake happens, and then their moral just goes like downhill, and they cannot like really keep it together. So, um, I thought that's like sort of a useful insight. Now, uh, definitely, there's a few ways we can play this if you wanna win directly bishop d4 mates, but I wanna show you the easiest way to win such positions. You just wanna exchange all the pieces and get it into the end game. So. Uh, if you are my student and you don't play bishop takes on f2, we're gonna have a problem. <laughs> so, okay, opponent does not even take, just plays b5. Mm, I could take on e6 with a check, I mean, that's like good enough. However, I'm just gonna play bishop b3 because I want to show a nice idea after he takes. So now I wanted to go for rook takes on e6. And... That's creating a little bit of tension with this uh, bishop. And he's probably going to have to take. What's the problem with rook f1? That looks like we're almost getting back rank. What would you guys play there? There's definitely like a few ways which uh, you can deal with this check. But uh, I think the easiest is just something like um, rook to e1 counter check. So it's very interesting to pick up on this little concept. Yeah, here we have it on the board. So rook f1 check, but we can give a counter check. Look at this. Oh, rook e1. This is in check. He has to move somewhere and then we pick up this rook. So the rook on e1 is immortal. Look at this rook. This is, uh, I don't know, just like a <laughs> rook that's uh, basically climbing on a super tall building without falling. So. Uh, it's like pretty well equipped, so uh, the rook is very safe the whole time. Don't do that at home. So, rook e1, pick up this, forcing resignation. And uh, actually, the idea that I wanted to highlight is after bishop takes, rook takes, rook takes on e6, uh, and then bishop takes on e6, king f8. Now, what would you guys play? This is a very important position that you really want to make sure you have a great understanding of this kind of scenarios because of course here it's like not really an important position as you could do more or less whatever and you will probably win but i mean just just look at this scenario okay just give you one scenario you take on b7 he goes rook g2 you try to win that pawn he takes on h2 you take a7 and now he's got to pass pawns all of a sudden that I don't know, he could try to push them, sure, maybe you're gonna be able to sacrifice your two pieces and stop that, but I mean, he already has a chance out of nowhere, so that's definitely how you end up not winning these type of games, and that is why it's super important to actually try to exchange all the pieces and uh, reduce the potential counterplay of the opponent. So, if you look at the top uh, three engine moves, the engine is not gonna teach you to play chess this way. The engine is just like seeing everything and never has these kind of technical difficulties of uh, what if this point happens if we enter that situation, which humans do. So the best move here to ever win these kind of positions and never really uh, uh, lose with two extra pieces and then complain about the fact that chess is hard. You just play rook f7. What do we do with that? Well, a lot of you may be like, dude, we're just blundering a piece. What the heck are you talking about? Well. Yes, but there's a little bit of a hidden point. So this move, forcing a trade. Now, because we're so much ahead in material, we still have the extra knight. I mean, think about it. Take the knight of the board. We only have an extra opponent C2. That is still a win. But it's for sure a win and they have no counterplay. Like, I I'm really curious, guys. I want to see how you can lose when opponent has only the king left. That is going to be a pretty tricky job. I mean, I'm telling you. So... You wanna make sure you do these kind of little things, giving uh, up a little bit of your material and just making sure you get into this kind of book win territory. And black has never any kind of play from these kind of positions. You just push these pawns, get a passer, and uh, then win these two, and then promote a queen, do whatever. So you can win this in many ways. So um, yeah, now just uh, for your curiosity on move uh, eight, when I mentioned Taking with the knight might be stronger according to the engine. We can actually check it together. So if you look at it, knight takes on d5, best move according to the engine. Queen takes on d5, not even top three. Bishop b5 is better and knight g5 is better. So see guys, that is why trying to learn chess alone with a computer is usually not gonna take you very far. It's a pretty 
terrible approach. I'm telling you, the best move practically, not even like top three of the engine. We can actually just do a little experiment and add more candidates. Let me do that. So we have three lines. Let's add five. Okay. Looks like the fifth move only is what we played. Queen takes on d5. I mean, give it a little bit more time. Maybe queen takes on d5 is not even on their radar. So imagine how many people get the misconception that, oh, queen takes on d5 is a bad move. I should have taken with a knight. I'm such a bad player. No, I mean, congrats if you took with a queen. That means you actually understand what you're doing and you've got a healthy long-term approach about chess, which is going to allow you to improve tremendously uh, in the long run. I mean, honestly, in the course of a year, somebody that's trying to play chess in this style, like going queen takes d5, could grab, let's say, like 500 rating points um, in rapid if they're like, let's say, 800, 900, while the person that's trying to play moves such as 95 and always chasing the top engine move will usually maybe climb like 100 points after a year or maybe just not climb at all because it's just uh, impossible to really recreate what the computer gives because it makes no sense most of the times, really. So, uh, Okay, hope that uh, is uh, opening some eyes. And uh, yeah, with that being said, I think uh, we can move on to the following game. All right, everybody, getting ourselves a game. And uh, we're going to be opening up in the most principled way, going e4. Opening up uh, both the bishop and the queen while putting a nice pawn in the center while threatening to go d4 and... Uh, cover all these nice uh, central squares and the opponent tries to stop me by going for e5 which is the uh, most common move that uh, you're gonna get to see in your games even though uh, after e4 black has kind of like five different main openings like let's say the sicilian the caro khan the pyrrhic defense the french uh like g6 kind of uh, modern they will mainly play e5 below 1500. And uh, against that, uh, I recommend uh, you go for the Vienna Gambit. I think that is a very underrated opening, especially uh, working uh, really, really well for players that are between beginner to intermediate. And uh, one of the main reasons is that it's filled with uh, very aggressive and uh, sort of easy moves to recreate. Well, our opponent basically has uh, a lot of the times to find uh, a very strong move. And that's like kind of the only move. Otherwise, uh, they get a pretty uh, difficult position to play for the rest of the game. So uh, after we play knight c3, normally black has a variety of moves. Uh, the most common ones are developing uh, either of the knights. It's kind of random. You should be prepared equally well against uh, every single one of these moves. Um, and uh, those are the main ones. Also sidelines that are very common for lower rated games. You're going to see like bishop before a ton, which is, you know, like lower rated players in these rating uh, range. They're just like developing their bishop, you know, like kind of like Taekwondo bishop. Everything just goes in like uh, b4 and g4. You know, they just um, want to play it as aggressive as they can, which, which is usually like a little bit of a mistake because most likely they'll have to give up the bishop for the knight. But that is actually a positive trade for us because, um, yeah, I think what I actually came across recently, you know, like if you... Uh, try to learn the game of chess, uh, everybody, everybody's going to tell you like that. So the queen is worth 9 points, maybe even 10 nowadays due to inflation. The rook is like 5, okay, second most important piece. And then it comes down to the knights and bishop, which are usually referred to as both uh, value 3 points, and they are sort of equal in strength. However, I think that's not like totally accurate, especially when you become a bit of a stronger player. Um... So the main reason is that the bishop is usually covering way uh, more squares in a chess game and that makes it a little bit stronger than the knight and I think you can evaluate it as three points uh, and a quarter compared to only three points for the knight. So now I hope you understand uh, why the taekwondo bishops are actually not uh, the smartest thing to do. So, um, anyways, we get none of that here. Opponent just plays knight f6 where 
once again, you've got a bunch of options, okay? You could play knight f3, transpose into like the four knights game, one of the most common openings that you see um, in lower rated games, which is not going to be my recommendation, because even though it's playable, I think it's nothing special. You could play bishop to c4, trying to get in like sort of a standard uh, Vienna opening, planning to go d3 and f4, and knight f3 later on transpose to the normal Vienna lines. However, the drawback of bishop c4 is that black can immediately go for a bit of a nice trick. Um, you can try to uh, find it here. It's one of the first tricks that uh, you learn when you enter the chess club because uh, it's not like really winning material, but they can go for knight e4, which is a bit of like a positional trick. Sacrificing the knight, and then if you take, there is d5. Hitting both the c4 bishop and the e4 knight, regaining the piece while destroying white center. Now, from a theoretical perspective, bishop c4, knight e4, queen h5 could be an interesting try for white, but leading to quite uh, complicated positions that um, I'm not necessarily a huge fan of. I think those are pretty hard to understand. The moves are not very natural. You just need to kind of remember a lot of computerish analysis, which I am generally not a huge fan of, and I prefer to keep it simple and uh, instead go for the Vienna Gambit by playing the move f4. And what this does, it's actually giving black the chance to go super wrong with what it takes on f4, which is the most common move by far in uh, lower rated games. Now, what they actually do, besides that, also d6 is quite common. They may be playing knight c6 still, defending. But rarely they will find the only good move, which is the counter gambit with d5. And okay, credits to my opponent. He actually finds this move. That is really impressive. I mean, for an N800 opponent, that is just, uh, you know, really surprising. I feel like most of your opponents won't be able to find this and they will just uh, naively accept the bait. And you can play e5 and the knight is not really going to have, uh, you know, not really going to have a safe square. You know, the knight needs uh, a good home after e5, but... You know, you just want to make sure that uh, he has to live with his parents. So he has to go like all the way back to g8. It's going to be like pretty ugly. You go knight f3 and then uh, d4, occupy the center, uh, regain the pawn. White is much better. So he plays d5 instead, where um, obviously many moves are possible. I mean, not really, because there's only kind of one good move for white, and that is taking on e5. Hitting the f6 knight and sort of forcing uh, the next move, which is knight takes on e4, regaining the pawn. And uh, we're actually going to be entering a little bit of a concrete situation where it's going to be sort of the first crossroads for white, where we have many options and uh, it's like a little bit of a matter of style. Uh, all right, what is this move? Bishop g4. This is, I mean, I have a whole course on this opening, you know, like an in-depth guide, but... I have to say, it never occurred in my mind that a move like bishop to g4 is actually playable in this position. So this is either brilliant prep or because this is not something that it's, you know, like theoretically it means it's bad. This means there's like a way to refute it and we just have to, um, yeah, try to find that. Are we going to do this? Probably not, but this is how you want to approach the game anyways. So he goes bishop to g4. now. Let's try to evaluate our options. Taking the knight, no good. Lose the queen. You probably don't want that. What else? Knight f3. Knight f3 is a move. Then, what I don't really like about knight f3 and why I wouldn't really take it as one of my main candidates is the fact that it is simply kind of like a defensive move. I would like to go for the most forcing moves first because... That is going to make it way easier for us to visualize uh, how the game will go. And this is something, by the way, that I really recommend in general. Both in-game and when you're trying to solve puzzles, you could really sort of uh, think uh, of a chess game like when you're playing pool yeah, or billiard or like whatever you like to name it. I'm like terrible at the game, but I really like to watch. So uh, basically, bishop to g4, I just like have a joke about the billiard and pool that I, I may actually deliver or not. I'm still like kind of considering, but for now, let's actually focus on the bishop g4 thing. Uh, 
yeah, wh why do you actually like want to think of it as it's a uh, pool? Well, it's the same thing. You don't want to focus on like potting one ball. You want to focus on potting the ball and then having a good position for the next pot. You really want to control the cue ball. So with bishop to e2, we're most likely going to be going for the most forcing move. Then we're going to take with a queen. It's going to be like easier to kind of predict where the cue ball is going to be. So, uh, yeah, for this reason, we're going to stick with that. And, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the joke about the uh, pool was that uh, when it comes to, <laughs> let's say, the only two things that uh, you could enjoy uh, in life um, while not being good at are sex and snooker. So that is, I don't know, you do whatever you want with that joke. Maybe we can even add this. <laughs> Probably not going to do that into the video, though. <laughs> so uh, we take with a queen. Now he goes uh, potentially because the knight is under attack. This is why I mentioned it. It's way easier to predict where the cue ball is going to be. He's most likely going to go and uh, grab this pawn. Going to be taking with a knight. And, you know, just going to go for like the most forcing moves. Okay. Opponent has an annoying knight. What do we do? This is a typical mistake, by the way, that I see in my students' games. Whenever their opponent has a strong piece, for some reason, they just uh, let that piece live for, you know, like a long, uh, long time. I mean, why would you do that? It's like, uh, you know, you just have uh, like a very ugly tree in your backyard and you just need to like cut the tree, make the backyard nicer. That's not like the greatest analogy ever, but you get it. So. Uh, yeah, has an annoying knight. Just get rid of it. Boom. He took and now I just take the free pawn. And already out of the opening, if you do the count, um, you can play knight f3, castle. That doesn't really have a lot to do with doing the count, but we have an extra pawn. Basically, that's what I'm going with this. Easy development. Uh, we already kind of won the game. Yeah, At this point, guys, this is important to actually think about the mindset of being into these positions okay because i really feel like uh, a lot of players would uh, really stress out at this point about how to actually win the game which is not how you want to approach this situation because the win is actually quite far away there is no way that uh like even magnus carlson is not really like visualizing every single thing how to win from this kind of position i mean maybe he is after this kind of dubious queen e7 move, but the point that I'm trying to make is you should just approach it as optimizing all of your pieces. It's probably going to be a long grind, so expect the game to go further, you know, over like move 40. But we always want to stay in control, exchange as many pieces as we can and try to get it into the end game with the extra pawn because all the king and pawn end game, if you have an extra pawn, that is like 99% a win. So, um, okay. Now, I said queen e7 is a little bit of a dubious move. Now, we have a choice between uh, knight f3 and keeping it simple or do something else, which is uh, maybe something you should uh, be thinking of because uh, our queen on e4 can actually go for a pretty interesting journey and grab that pawn on b7. Okay, It's a bit of like an exotic journey. Not gonna lie. It's like the uh, chess Olympiad that took place in India. That's like a long, uh, <laughs> gonna be a long flight. So, I mean, you have to like consider these things, even though I'm a fan of keeping it simple. I'm like considering queen b7 and then you wanna sort of know where the cue ball is gonna be. We're threatening the rook, no immediate way for him to defend. But what can he do? He, go, he can go for queen e5 check. And then we can block the check with knight e2. And I think he has no other checks after that. And I think uh, he has no ways to defend the rook. So perhaps the uh, trip to India is no longer looking that bad at this point. Gonna be rewarded the rook. So may uh, very well just go for it. Now, opponent doesn't really have a lot of options. I also consider queen h4 check. But uh, we can simply stop it with g3. And don't forget, you could think of, oh, there is check on e4. But our queen also moves backwards. We can actually just uh, pick up that queen. That's not an option. He goes for the check, blocking with a knight as promised. And 
at this point for him it's best play to try out something like uh, bishop c5, bishop d6, and uh, hoping to get castled uh, ASAP. But then uh, it's going to be actually a very interesting situation because I think the best move might not be uh, that obvious as you think. Uh, so yeah, let's actually watch out and uh, wait a little bit for him to make the move. Going for something like 97 is definitely a mistake. This would be sort of like a desperate try uh, by lower rated players, just trying to, hoping that I don't take and then they can save the rook. I mean, at this point, when you see the queen on b7, you should just give up on the rook, okay? You shouldn't be like emotionally attached to it. I, I, I get it, you know, like the rook on a8 is just like a very nice, lovely pet that uh, he used to grow up with. But I mean, we're losing it now. I just have to deal with it. I, I, it might be tough, guys. Sorry that I'm putting you through that emotions, but all right. There is not going to be like any more rook there. That's gone. Now time to do the best out of our situation. So for black would be best to try to go bishop c5, stop us from uh, castling, um, and then go short castle. So here, then we can take stealing our opponent's pet, but we're not like such a bad person, okay? I mean, maybe after we move, after this move, we will, but uh, I wanted to say, if they actually move the bishop there, there's something even a better move than taking the rook. And you could think of that uh, for a little while. I'll let that sink. But for now, he just played king e7, which... Honestly, it is not really a move that uh, I can uh, justify and really explain. I just can't, okay? King e7 is like bone cloud. <laughs> this guy's like watching way too much he carve nowadays. Um, so, yeah, I think we'll just have to cash in the free material. No need to do anything tricky. And the queen has a pretty easy path. Back home, he's like trying... You see, I, I like this move from him. I like c6, I like the idea. Even though, uh, let's say, it's not really going to be good enough. I like that he's trying to box in the queen. That's a good concept. Whenever you lose material, if your opponent is not careful, say I would be sleeping here, yeah? I would be castling. Then black has a great move to actually sort of trap our queen in the corner. Um, and uh, that is to just go queen c7. Rotating this and... Just imagine, in like an ideal world, they could finish development 97 and then, whoops, uh, just uh, pick up our queen. So you really want to be careful with that. And um, we'll just try to uh, bring the queen back home ASAP. He could have captured the pawn, you not know, like really uh, a greedy person. I don't really recommend it to be either, uh, especially like when it comes to chess, but maybe to other things as well. So... Uh, I'm just giving a check so I can uh, return back home uh, with a queen. And uh, yeah, okay, we're seeking to e8. Now we could definitely just castle and uh, try to finish development. We could think of a move such as d4 hitting their queen, but perhaps even more uncomfortable for black, just going queen c8. Really positioning well the cue ball because we know what's going to be the next move. He only has king e7, so that is going to be blocking the bishop, going to make it pretty tough for him to finish development. Um, and then, yeah, we should have a much easier time uh, converting this. I'm just going to go d4, which is opening up the bishop, potentially joining the game, gaining a tempo against their queen, and I'm not worried about a check because we can simply continue our development. I play a move like bishop d2 while gaining a tempo. C queen to d6, trying to keep the knight under protection. But here we have a very strong move that's actually taking advantage of both the queen and the ba knight. And that is actually, you know, why it was so nice to actually place the knight on e2 in the first place. Because it's covering the f4 square for the bishop. And we managed to catch uh, this bad boy in the same diagonal. Now, kind of only move that uh, white, uh, I mean, black could try to get some counterplay is once again the check. But we've got many moves. 
Probably the simplest uh, should be just to block the check with c3. We can take our pawn on b2. And then we actually have a great move, uh, which maybe I'll get to show in the analysis tab after the game. That was, I think, an interesting position, by the way. So this gets played. I think at this point, we just pick up the free knight. And on the very next move, um, yeah, I think I'm going to do... Uh, I'm going to go for like the simpler strategy, not trying to go for the mate uh, immediately. Okay, he plays bishop to, I mean, queen h4. I'm going to just uh, block it with the bishop. Notice that with every single move that I make, I'm trying to gain a tempo. So my opponent's moves are kind of forced in the first place. So when it looks like, uh, you know, you see the game of chess, it has like so many opportunities. And it's like, at first, it looks so hard to guide yourself and come up with like the right approach. In fact, it's not really so true because as you can see, while focusing on moves that constantly create a threat, your opponent is quite restricted on just a very few options and, and makes it way easier for you to predict stuff. Now, this is perhaps the most important position of the whole, uh, the whole video. So if you made it till this point, if there's anything you want to pick up, in you know from this uh, game and that you can apply not only in lower rated games but this is a strategy that's super effective to get you to even like over 2000 if you like are able to master this skill of converting winning possessions i mean that is already going to take you very far in chess okay it's hard to come up with a number but you have to take my word for that so try to come up with a move in this position okay that's like the first uh, instinct and I'm actually going to try to uh, recreate what I feel like uh, the answer of the audience would be here. Assuming you guys are like below 1400, if you are like by any chance over 2000 watching this video, I mean, congrats to you, but you probably know how to win this position as a 2000. So I think a lot of the lower rated players would think like this. They're going to be like, okay, there's Queen E check. Oh, that just takes... No, okay, I'm kidding. It's not going to be that, but... I think a lot of the lower rated players would think of a move like queen c7 check. Would think of, like, maybe take the pawn with a check. Maybe go rook f1. Eat the queen. Maybe castle. Okay, I'm kidding. Castle is not, like, a legal move because the king cannot go through check. So I think rook f1 will be the move on, of, like, a lot of you that are watching. Maybe bishop e5. Hitting the queen. And another candidate uh, perhaps could be Long Castle. I feel like that's how you guys would approach. And that would be a mistake, okay? Uh, not according to the computer, okay? If you're analyzing this with the engine, they're not going to tell you, dude, you just did something pretty silly. But I see this theme all the time in my students' games. Whenever they have something like this, like a king on e7, let's say, they get so triggered, they just have to win the game by checkmate. Which is not true. I mean, in reality... You shouldn't be thinking of checkmate at all. The way you want to think of winning chess games is you basically win a pawn, you exchange all the pieces, you let your opponent with the king alone, then you promote your pawn, and then you checkmate with a king and queen in the end game. It's like a grind, a long journey, I know, but there are no risks along the way. This is just the easiest and the most lucrative approach that you want to have in mind. So... Forget about a checkmate, even in positions like this where your opponent's king is uh, misplaced. Okay, if the material is even and you have to go for a mating attack, uh, by all means, go for it. But when you're already having an extra piece, that's kind of changing the situation a little bit because you could just go for a winning endgame and we do that with uh, queen to e5. Forcing the queen to okay, super important. Once you make this move, you're never really going to lose again from these type of situations, unless uh, you really suck at chess, but that's why you're onto this channel. So um, we're going to fix that, I promise, uh, if it can be fixed. So he plays f6. I'm going to go bishop back to g3. Now, OK, what's the next step? We want to make sure we get our rooks connected. So we castle, prepare castle long, because the rook is potentially already useful here. and. Uh, Okay, 
how do we make progress from this position? Because it looks like, okay, we've got a lot of pieces, but it's not like so easy and straightforward to break through. Well, for this reason, you need some open files. Now, what is a good move that could potentially open up a lot of space for our pieces? Um, I think in this position, because we have uh, played this very nice move with Storm Castle, we can actually just go for d5 because the rook is supporting that pawn. And with this, we're potentially opening up the rook's path, and then it's going to be way easier to infiltrate in our opponent's camp. Okay, think of rook d7. Whenever you can play rook on the 7th rank and it's not hanging, that is usually the best move. So, uh, okay, I'm going to stick to my word, give a check, and one is under attack. Now, you also don't want to forget about the fact that previously our knight was hanging. It's not anymore after this. And yeah, just um, keep it simple, start collecting his pawns. Which one do you guys think it's better? Just take the a7 pawn, remain with like 3 connected passers, or... Take on g7 and uh, try to ruin this uh, pawn structure. This is like a little bit of an interesting detail. And uh, I think it's a bit better to actually go uh, pick up this one. Because now this is still remaining a double attack. So technically speaking, it is better because we're winning an extra pawn. Compared to like the previous one. If we were to take on a7, he could have just defended the pawn on g8. So, uh, okay. Pawn just goes bishop to f8. Opponent is chilling. Um, just gonna pick up another pawn. I guess this time, uh, yeah, we should just uh, stick with rook takes on a7, getting the nice uh, connected passers, and on the next move, uh, we should just uh, try to bring the rook into the game. So, plays h6. Now, uh, what do you guys think uh, would be the most uh, efficient way to uh, bring the rook into the game? Because... You could do it right away. Play rook d1, rook f1, get rook onto the, like, the open file. But I think even better is to start with a check. Because then we could potentially bring the rook onto like, uh, even the e-file. Or it could come with a check. So I feel like that's just winning a little bit of time. Um, okay, at this point, I think rook e1 is another instructive move. Because apparently I'm hanging the knight. Okay, I'm like kind of aware of that. Don't worry. I mean... Guys, I know, I know you see when I'm blundering, okay? I had like a game that got like 100 comments. Dude, you missed rookie tree. Yeah, maybe I did, but maybe I didn't. How about I actually allow that on purpose because rookie tree was such an easy win that I thought queen d7 is even more instructive. And you just got baited, guys. And you just sent 100 comments just getting great engagement to that video and boosting its views. I mean, who's the winner at the end of the day? Who's the winner? Have you thought about it that way? I, I'm an IM at the end of the day. Like, what do you think? That could be... A, I'm just saying, that could be an option too. Sadly, it's not, but... I mean, you get it, so... But then please look to the aid. Um, and, okay, he's avoiding the trade, yeah? This is interesting to see, because you may be wondering, all right, can they just avoid the trade and make it... Uh, keep the game kind of complicated? Well, whenever they avoid the trade, they make a big concession. So, if you look at the previous position... Opponent is controlling the open file. We play rook e1, forcing a trade, and in case he doesn't trade, well, congrats, you just won the open file. Now you have one extra open file. Okay, now, we could definitely look for trades, or we could go for, like, a checkmate. I'm just gonna go for the checkmate, because we're kind of low on time, but if you play the move knight e6, exchanging, that is not a mistake either. So we see king to g4. Now there is the h3 move, but that's dropping the bishop, so there is a move that is preparing that and kind of putting the enemy king in the mating net, so I think for that perspective, rook e3 is quite nice. Covering the bishop, and I don't see how he's like planning to stop this h3 move. Bishop b4 is actually a great idea, hitting the rook and threatening bishop d2, but h3 looks like a checkmate to me. So that, you know... Checkmate kind of ends the game. I mean, you made it till this video just to get that piece of information, okay? You can even type it in the comments for others that didn't. So we are getting all enlightened. Checkmate ends the game. You heard it here. Alex Bans that channel. That's why you watch and you should have have you should have probably have subbed already. So uh we managed to get this game and um I think there was something interesting I was supposed to highlight uh, after the game. So after like queen e7, queen b7, 
92. Yeah. King E7 was definitely a very weird move. I was like, dude, what is this guy doing? He's just like kind of watching Hikari in the back while playing this game and kind of hard to like, oh, he, he was like, if I'm losing, I mean, let me lose with a bone cloud. I mean, that's a win-win, right? I mean, lose with a bone cloud. I mean, that's just, it doesn't matter. So maybe that was his thinking, but I don't know. Okay. Maybe we should ask, but I don't know. He just goes King E7, but if he was to play Bishop to C5, remember I told you, it's actually not the best move to capture the rook. So what do you think would be better? I think it's even better to just go queen c8. And his only move is king e7. He can pick up the other rook. And why this is so good is that now his king is messed up. Plus, these pieces are paralyzed. If he moves the knight, he's losing the rook. He has no checks and uh, white is completely winning. So, yeah, besides that, and this was pretty simple. Went for the end game and the rest was uh, pretty straightforward. So, uh, yeah, I think that's uh, all for this game and uh, we can just move on to the following one.